Can everyone hear me okay? So, um, background on me, I'm a mathematician by training. I went to work in hedge funds, um, did some consultancy post-crisis, with the hedge fund I was at blew up during the crisis. Um, I then ended up being head of research at AGFB, which is a uh, structured finance boutique. Uh, so clients who are top tier, private funds, central banks, um, great to the good like that. Uh, and recently I'm running my own startup, so in wholesale, um, short term investment grade financing market, so money market funds, that sort of stuff. So I'm CTO there, so CIO, CFO, you know, end up doing everything of these things, we've got two other partners there. Um, so within this business, we need to run business processes, and it's quite important we, we don't drop the ball, we, we get it right. And it's also something important that I show to investors that we have this nail down and we're doing the right thing. So naturally I looked at sort of workflow engines, and you know, it's quite a hot topic, there's been a number of talks actually just today on, on workflow. Um, the problem was I, I'm, I didn't quite like what I saw really, to be honest, I wasn't quite achieving what I wanted, what I wanted to achieve. So um, I so basically ended up doing my own, my own thing, um, or rather a framework that can work with other people's stuff, but also do my own. So it's, what do I mean by that? So, so workflow is quite a big uh, concept. So we've talked we've talk a lot of stuff about here on the, on the Pi Data Tracker about uh, data pipelines. So that's quite a big thing, running on some you know, big iron out there. This is a slightly different emphasis. This is on business processes. So a task here, instead of doing matrix vector multiplication, it might be go and send a message to the trader to get on the phone to JP Morgan to place a trade, you know, or go and do a messenger and then click a button and he's done. You know, it, it, it's much more human-based. Um, as well as being techie. So three main, main things. You've got concurrency going on there. It can be long running. You know, that process can be running for months, if not years. Uh, I think there's an employee process. You know, hire somebody, pay their salary, fire them, that kind of thing. Um, it can be coordinating external services. You've got REST interfaces in there, databases, stuff like that. So there's a mixture of mixture of things. There's a, an ISO standard it's called PPMN2, which I don't know if anyone has seen, um, but it's it, yeah, very businessy. So. Um, basically, I mean, there's a lot of stuff around it. It's tasks connected through some process, so you're, you're sort of relatively familiar with it. So I'll give you a quick overview of sort of what this will do. The internet works. Okay, so this is kind of what a lot of people are doing. You, you end up with a business analyst who will draw out a business process uh, in Eclipse or, or some similar editor like this. Um, and it's so a box of a task, and they're drawing some sort of flow control constructs to connect it together. And this is not necessarily a programmer doing this, this is some sort of analyst. Um, you know, may not necessarily be the greatest programmer, they might be programmers, they might not be. So they'll end up drawing something like this. I mean, it, it's boxes, you end up putting in specific parallel split and join operators. It's quite a rich language that you can do to describe what you're going on there. You end up clicking on a box, you then have to fill in some parameters, so maybe a box is send an email, you have to type in who it's from, who it's to. And that, that, so, you know, do I want to be a user of this? Well, you know, this is okay, I suppose. But then how does it connect to the tasks? What sort of scaffolding do I need around this? How do I interact with the user interface? Do I have, you know, vendor lock-in on these things? So, going through it, um, you know, let's, let's try using it. So I, I, Put it into Eclipse, I do something, create it, let's look at the file, bunch of XML, you know, it does, it's not, you know, as a programmer, this feels like a, a, not not best thing to, to use. If you look at the code here, and I see if you go into the XML, it's like, almost like a, someone drew it, it was like, here's a task, here's an edge, I'm going to connect the two together, and then it's very, very glorious. So, that was, that was 10k of XML just to do the diagram. You've then got to add in those parameters, those extra stuff. Do the forms and HTML, you then have to do uh, all your boilerplate and rest bindings, sorry. Um, you know, a lot of scaffolding around this stuff. You end up using developers for almost everything, apart from just that one diagram to start the business to So, the big problem about this, though, is it's parallel programming with go-to and global variables. So this is a bad idea, I would say. Right, I don't mean too controversial, but, but we know as programmers, that is very error prone. Um, but this is what business users are using. And this is sort of in the enterprise, you know? There's, there's big money essentially going around with these things. 
So there's a number of other problems, you know, you, because it's all XML based, if you want to do a diff of a diagram, do I put this in DBCS? How do you do that? It's, it's not great. Really. So let's try and do the opposite. Let's, let's chuck out everything and then do the minimal we need to do to, to kind of solve the problem. Let's make something text based. Now, if it's structured, avoiding all the issues about go to's and, and so on and parallelism. Let's, let's make it play nicely with our tools, tools we've got like DBCS and so on, and do documentation all the best, best practices. Um, has anyone done that? Well, there's um, some of the script, it's still pretty bad, it's still an explicit linking of, of tasks, explicit parallelism, very, lots of boilerplate, don't really like that. Um, so let's start from the basics. So if I've got this example workplace so I picked up from the video, it's a, um, if, we, if I view this as a tree, I, I put my root on the right hand side, that is a recombinant tree. Okay? So how, how do I do that? Well, a lot of workflow engines, I think we've seen it from Silk and some of the others today, you basically just list your tasks, list of tasks, and put down the, what it depends on. What task does it, does it depend on? So the predecessor. So, so in a graph theory sense, that's, that's a, an adjacency list representation. So already there, so instead of all of that XML, I've just reduced it down to really, logically, there's only six lines. It, it's a perfectly good representation of that graph. So that's where a lot of workflow engines will just say, right, I'm done. You know, just, just put it down in that format. You know, whatever syntax, I'll just use you know, brackets here. But can we do anything more interesting with that? Well, um, I'm lazy, so I don't like typing out lots. So what if I substitute in uh, the predecessors into nested lists? So I get these two nested lists. Well, that's, that's a tree, you know? Trees and nested list. What if I then combine it all, all together to get this expression here? Say, so, well, that's not quite what I want, because that's now giving me a tree. If we look at it here, I've got this request refund, and I've got request refund here as well. So I need to sort of indicate this is a shared argument. Right. So this is where it's gone. So this is exactly what the, what the, sorry, the lambda uh, calculus is. So this is, um, if you introduce a lambda term around it, so I have lambda request in the, in the body, and then do a beta reduction with this term here. That is exactly what a recombinant tree is. So I wish I had, I could claim this, this I was the first to discover this, but there's actually a PhD thesis by a guy called Peter Kelly who published on this um, a few years before I invented several on it, so it's a bit annoying. But it, it's actually really good. A lambda calculus is a model for defining workflows. So, uh, lambda calculus is a little bit unwieldy. So, has anyone done a programming language around lambda calculus? Yes, of course they have. It, it's Scheme. So, why don't we just use Scheme syntax rather than invent a new language? Uh, that seems pretty good. So, you know, just we can get rid of lambda. We can use the let form for that. So, hopefully, everybody's seen a bit of list or Scheme that time. Um, so, what do we end up with? So, I've got this bit of code, right? So. That, I claim, is isomorphic to the diagram. It represents the same information. And to prove that, I've done a compiler for it. So I compile that code to that diagram. So I use uh, PyGraphViz to do that, or the you know, Python code to do it. So this is quite cool. So this is what I'm doing now. Is, and this is a general concept. You can use it any time you're dealing with, um, in fact, here, this is a direct, direct acyclic graph. You've got to get down. You could represent it in, in this schemey kind of format which may or may not be useful to you. For me, I think it's quite useful. Um, so, can we go further though? Right? Is, the, is, is it really scheme or is it just look a bit like scheme? Well, sort of. If you take the applicative subset of scheme, like the pure functional subset, so we remove mutation, so you can't rewind variables, so there are no such things as variables, they're only constants. So it's a pure functional language, apart from tasks may cause side effects, so maybe that's sending email, so that will Run, it doesn't change anything within the language, but it may have external side effects and say, well, then yes, it does actually work. Um, so this is part of the, the fun you know, thesis research you've got on that stuff. Why Scheme and not any other language? Well, if you run through the logic how this works, you really need something strict, dynamically typed, tail recursive, static electrical scope, and it helps if other people use it. It's basically a Scheme. So um, the fun thing is about this, if you have a pure functional language, the evaluation order is, is, is really independent. The result you get is independent of the evaluation order. So you know about things like lazy reduction, normal form, strict, and so on. So in, specifically, it can be concurrently evaluated, which is really, really useful. 
So if you think about the semantics of strict uh, function calls, uh, if you've got a, a function with two arguments, you can clearly evaluate those independently because language with pure functional, they won't affect each other. That's part of the side effects which you're already watching out for. So that's, that's already parallel split and synchronized. So you're getting a lot of the way uh, automatically uh, with this language. So again, okay, so let's, let's develop a bit further. Um, you had all these parameters that you put into your tasks that we're, you're clicking on boxes in the editor in Eclipse. We just stick those in as keyword arguments. Um, slightly different from Python syntax, but you know, get the idea. Um, well, that's what we do. We put in uh, data to make it explicit, you know, just make sure the data flows properly so we don't have dynamic scope or, yeah, you because know, in, in the standard BPMN paradigm, you have global variables here. I don't want that. I want, I want to explicitly pass data around. We're programmers, so we can look at this code that we produce because we're just writing diagrams in code and we're just saying, well, actually, let's clean this up a bit. Um, I, instead of, if you look at this one, I've got handle request one, the composition on mail task, and I've got handle request two, that's not obvious that that should be, that should make sense. So if we think about typing of that, we can unify the types and split them out, and the scheme has got this begin form. So that just simply means sequence the guess expressions and the sequence expressions before each other. So I, when I get to that point, I think, well, actually, that looks pretty good. That is basically executable code, but it's also a, a very clear definition of what was in uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the BPMN diagram thing. So someone just created a diagram, clicked on all the boxes, typed in all the stuff, but, they, but it's all lost in this XML. You can't see it very clearly. Here we have just the minimum, I really think it's the minimum amount of information you need to express what's going on. So uh, a couple of fun things we can do. So, so this is where we ended up. I just suppressed all the data bindings that are at the begin in the mail class. What happens when I delete the begin? So I'm going to just chop out that form. The answer is you get more concurrency. So just a nice little thing. But uh, it's basically trying to do as much parallelism as possible. So what do we do now? This is just abstract syntax. So let's say you've got your favorite workflow engine. There's no reason why you couldn't represent it in that form and compile it to whatever input you want. So for me, I just wanted a really lightweight engine. So you could either compile it and do an interpreter. Um, I make an interpreter. So of course, you use Python for this, because Python's great. Um, so what I do now, this is, this is scheme syntax reporting modules. So I just do a link. So I basically just define what the import function is in work scheme, uh, which just basically links into Python modules. So my tasks in my language are now bog standard Python functions. Right, so I need almost next to no scaffolding at all to connect all three things together. So basically just run it through uh, multi-processing in, in a, a sub-process. So for example, I wrote a little email module in Python. I import it, it gives me the send mail function here. And so if I want to use it, I just give it, give it the data, the keyword arguments. I can bring in other fun stuff, so Ginger, for example. So I can bring in the render thing, I can render templates. So, and then of course, so this is me writing code here with my code hat on, writing some scheme. Then of course I remember that's isomorphic to a diagram. So what does the diagram look like? Well, I run my compiler on it and I get this. So this is again using standard BPMN uh, syntax. So it's got this little circle thing throwing a message. So I can give that to a business user who may not be a programmer at all, he would understand what I'm doing, what my business process is. So data structures, I like explicit data structures, I like typing, so let's use JSON schema to represent complex types. Let's do some user interface. Now, if you've got an existing workflow solution, often they'll have you know, a UI built into it and you've stuck with that UI. I want, I want something more flexible, I don't really care about what the front end is. So, so a lot of people use Trello these days, so why not use Trello? So I just write a Python module, which is some very, very simple REST code, uh, so it gets and puts to Trello, and I just expose some, some words, postcard, you know, archive card, um, get list, and um, I also write my own little get user input, just a little, very simple web-based interface thing. So to interact with the user, it's a very little amount of code I write there, but again, is this code or is this a business process? It's both, so I can diagram this. So this is now, there's a flow here, and notice it's spotted that it can render the diagram and do a, you know, API call to Trello in parallel. So the last piece, if I've got those, that generic user interface thing, I can just 
implement um, these last two remaining symbols in my full workflow as as subprocessors, and then I'm done. So then I can do like more stuff to generalize uh, this concept. So that was a very simple workflow. But what, how powerful can we get? The answer is pro probably powerful. So um, something workflow called exclusive choice. So not every workflow does this. So if you're doing a pure computational one, you just grind through the numbers. But some things you want to run a task and then get some data about output, a boolean output, and then just switch and, and just do you know, different paths of execution from that. That's just an if statement, clearly. Um, so you can see that that's how you encode the syntax, but you remember what, what's happening. Because these are parallel, you know, really test alternative consequence could be any structure. There's a nice thing about scheme, of course. You, you, where I've got test, it doesn't have to be a task, it can be any other expression, any other process can go in there. One nice thing, if you notice this, is what, why wouldn't that be like a standard function, like a, you know, do these three, these three, these, these, these three things in parallel, and then move on. The answer is because of laziness. The, the if is lazy in, in these two arguments. You know, it's very strict in the first one. So laziness, we see here, actually changes the order of valuation. So it's quite interesting, because you can then create other um, flow control construct, constructs as soon as you have some way of getting hold of laziness. The other one is recursion. So this is fun. So here's, here's an example. I'm just doing if, just to embed it. Is I've got a, a main process here, and I call it recursively. When I die around it, it's just now power pointing backwards. So it's a very, very simple concept. But think about what's happening here. This is um, looping in a, in a business process. So this, this gives me, obviously, Turing completeness. Um, maybe not so obviously, but it probably does. And if you think about some of the workflow engines you've seen today, they deal with directly acyclic graphs. This is now, we've removed the requirement for acyclicality. This is, this is just a direct graph. So, Scheme is quite nice about this. So, if your scheme program saw all this, they would say that's fine because that's, that's in a tail position, so that's a tail call. Scheme is required to optimize our tail calls. Unfortunately, you no know, Python doesn't. But, so that is actually efficient in idiomatic code. This diagram is also idiomatic BPMN. There's a natural correspondence between. So with this, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Whereas in, in BPMN, when you're drawing diagrams, it's naturally only tail recursion that you're doing. Right? You're, just, you're just always just pointing to go where to go next, and you just go around and you, until you finish. Here, in Scheme, we can represent something that's a recursion that's not in a tail position. So you actually have a more powerful language. You have a, a stat frame. You can fill up you know, stats by going round and round, and then unwinding and do all the usual sorts of tricks. <coughs> Not less if you want to, but it's interesting that there's something more powerful going on from this map. Uh, so, yeah, so this is what I claim. There's, there's sort of a functor, if you like, from business process management, a generalized concept of workflow, which I think is, is all encompassing, all the various workflow forms that fall into this and we denoted it in the um, To work scheme, again, it just could be any pure functional language of, of, of this kind of type. Um, but it's an interesting, there's a mapping in it, so you can do it two ways as well. So, uh, once we put it in text, we can do some really good, good things. We can add commenting, so we have documentation mapping with our business process. We can then apply standard tools to it, so Sphinx is great for producing documentation. So what happens if we combine the two? Well, this, this is where we start to get some really cool stuff. So business, pro business users love it, so I can show this to my chief executives, my, my co-founder. And he says, what are we doing about this process? How do we buy security? How do we take the orders from clients? And I can just show and say, well, this is what we do. So this is you know, standard documentation. So as Python programmers, we're not impressed by this. But for a business user, this does not exist. This, this sort of level of documentation is, is pretty awesome, where I've got proper documentation here. And the nice thing is I, I combine it with my BPMN renderer. So I can do um, a little diagram that goes with it, which a user will read this and say, oh, well, that's a diagram that sort of describes what the code is doing. But actually, it's the code itself. It's just a diff different representation of exactly the same information. So, so it's taking your literal program to the next sort of next level, I think, which is you know, combining um, documentation that programmers use, but also business users can use. I mean, they combine it with obviously the normal documentation. So, for example, that's send email saying, here's my you can see it very well. But, um, basically, there's my Python code, send email, you know, just using the standard libraries. 
I do one line at the top. I just put an export line here. That's all the scaffolding I need to make it work nicely. But I'm afraid, but I don't, you know, don't do any more than that's necessary. I can put it under version control, dynamic diff, so I can actually now see very clearly what a diff is between two things. Again, it's trivial if you're a programmer. However, think about this in a business process. What is the business process for hiring somebody or um, making uh, spam and eggs in a restaurant? You know, that could be a workflow, and then you now change it, and you have a sous chef in your it has, now does the spam, or someone does the eggs, and how, what does that diff look like? You know, it's quite interesting as a concept what you can do. You can have, BPM can do more exotic things you wouldn't normally find in your standard workflow engine. So things like sending signals, so this is, you interact with a message broker, could it wrap MQ or AWS, like SNS and SQS, that kind of stuff. So in this language, it's really easy. I can just, for any concept, any business concept there is in workflow, I can, in BPM, I can just simply add a special uh, form for it, a function. And then that hides the, 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 all the complexity that I need. So in the throw signal, that's connecting to AWS, doing all the whole stuff. I can boil it down to just the minimum amount of information I need to represent that. So you can see, you get the flavor of this. This is, this is a domain-specific language for business processes embedded into the scheme. So uh, fun internals, which uh, you know, get on there. Well, what I do, I write an interpreter for this, which doesn't use the Python stack. So you probably must have seen a scheme interpreter in Python, you know, using Norway stuff. This is a little bit more exotic. You, you never use the Python control, stu control structures. Everything is done explicitly as, as data. So you can save the data structure to disk after every I/O call. So it sounds inefficient, and it is, but. When your tasks are not fine grained, these are, you know, trade to go and make a phone call, it could be off making a cup of tea. Your latency is massive for these things, it's user tasks. But that means if I pull the plug on, on the machine and I restart it, I've got a data structure that's loaded to memory and I just resume my computation. So it's, it gives me uh, that robustness that I need. Um, the whole thing is built around AsyncIO, which is really good, great, great fun. Um, so, there's a, so I put in the title of the, the talk, um, Asynchronous Generators, which is a new feature of 3.6, uh, which seems a bit esoteric when you see it first of all, and I was quite interested using this, I found it really good, well, it was really useful to me anyway, so I thought it might be an interest here. So this is broadly, let's say when I have a, a user interact with us, so you imagine a web page and the user just submits in a form and sends it. This is the sort of thing we want to do, this is, this is you know, your typical receive handler. You know, we get uh, a request, we process it somehow, it's, you know, using asynchronously because we're doing I.O. I then want to save it to some data store, right? Only once it's been saved and committed, replicated through some database, do I then want to respond back to the user. Why is that? So if I'm a user submitting data, I only want to see the web page come back to me. And when I see that, I know that it's been properly transmitted across. If I don't see that come back, it may or may not have been saved, but I want to have a positive confirm. Now, all the existing workflow engines I've seen, they don't tend not to do that. They tend to have process, run the task, the task does some I.O. and gets it, which would be some uh, interaction with the user. It closes the connection and then it passes it to the workflow engine and then it saves it. So you've got a window which your, your data is volatile. It's not been saved anywhere, but yet the user thinks it's been saved, so I don't like that. So this is the sort of thing I write in my tasks. But then I, I don't like this, because I'm now, this save thing, I'm, I'm sort of stuck with this. Either I have to mention exactly what I want to do, save it, or I have to have some link into my framework somehow. Um, when that sort of defeating part of the point of using a workflow engine, you want your, your business tasks like this to be decoupled from the process. So we need to invert this control. So that's exactly what a generator does. It's a way of inverting control. So I can just yield this instead. So at this point, I do a yield. We go up into the framework. The framework can do whatever. I can save it to disk. I can perhaps send that data into other tasks, other processes. So, but of course it's asynchronous. So imagine my delight when asynchronous generated in uh, 3.6. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, so for a little bit of time. But anyway, that gives you a flavor of what I'm doing. Uh, you know, you can compile this as well. Uh, you, you can learn lots of, you know, 
fun things when you look at Steam concepts and take them back. I mean, one thing is which in Steam you've got your Valve, of course. So if you think about this, there's some fun things you can do here at runtime, creating workload and then Valve. So, yeah, that's, that's uh, workflow for me. Yes, yes, I do.